We begin the show with the price of oil, which has risen to its highest in years over the past week. Demand for the commodity has grown due to the easing of strict pandemic restrictions. And as Paolo Montecilia reports, geopolitical tensions are also threatening to hamper global supplies. A Danish frigate sails to the Baltic Sea to patrol the waters off Eastern Europe. It's part of a NATO military buildup in response to what the alliance says are Russian preparations to invade Ukraine. As tensions between the West and Moscow heat up, Ukrainians near the border are calling for cooler heads to prevail. I hope our nations will come to an understanding soon. I don't know whether there will be war or not, but I don't want that. Hopefully there will be no war mm -hmm. and we will live in peace. The Kremlin has dismissed allegations that it's planning to attack its neighbor as pure hysteria. But that reassurance has done little to calm financial markets. The price of crude has risen more than 10 percent over the past month amid fears that an escalation could hurt Russian exports. Adding to those worries are recent missile attacks by Houthi rebels in Yemen against Emirati oil production facilities. I guess for the UAE as a whole, you know, its status as a reliable oil supplier um, and also as a, as a hub for regional trade and logistics and finance, all of that is very much underpinned by um, what has so far been uh, you know, a very stable and, and, and favorable security landscape. All this is taking place as the world's thirst for oil grows. The easing of pandemic restrictions means factories are reopening, planes are back in the skies, and people are hitting the road again. Colder than usual weather in places like China, Europe, and the U.S. is also increasing demand for fossil fuels, meaning that a failure to keep the peace between Russia and Ukraine could come at a hefty price. Paolo Montesilio, TRT World. Neil Atkinson is an independent oil industry analyst in Paris. He tells us what an escalation between Russia and Ukraine would mean for the European economy. In the event of an invasion and in the event of uh, Russian supplies of, of oil and gas being either significantly reduced or even cut off, there is a huge risk mainly to the European economy because we're in the middle of winter here. We could get a short, sharp spell of very cold weather. Stocks of gas in Europe are very, very low or lower than normal. And uh, there is a huge risk to the European economy. And that partly explains why the Europeans have adopted a slightly more a cautious approach to the situation than the United States. But in terms of getting more gas for Europe, if there were to be a cutoff of Russian supplies, this is a very complicated question because big suppliers such as Qatar have long-term contracts, not just with European buyers, of course, but mainly to Asian buyers. And getting those contracts amended or changed in some way is going to require intergovernmental cooperation between the U.S., say, and Qatar, and perhaps governments of Asian economies who are major customers of Qatar. So it's a very complicated situation. Right now, Russia is the biggest supplier of the natural gas that millions of European households need to heat their homes and businesses to run their machinery. Moscow wants to sell even more to the bloc, with a commodity flowing through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. It's a 1,230-kilometer pipeline between Russia and Germany. Construction is complete and Moscow is ready to start pumping 55 billion cubic meters of gas every year to Europe's largest economy, unlocking potential revenues of about $15 billion a year at current prices. Germany relies heavily on natural gas to meet its energy needs. With a 27% share, it's the second biggest power source behind oil. Nearly half of this gas comes from Russia, passing through Poland and Ukraine on the way. Those countries earn commissions, which will be lost once Nord Stream 2 is operational. Besides Poland and Ukraine, the UK and the US also oppose this pipeline. Washington wants European allies to avoid reliance on Moscow. Foreign Minister and I spoke today about one of those areas of disagreement, the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, which we continue to believe is a threat to Europe's energy security. Germany has a different perspective. And that happens uh, from time to time uh, among friends. Building infrastructure to receive gas shipments from the US would take years. German consumers will save billions by using Russian gas pumped through Nord Stream 2. But it could come at the cost of Berlin's 
closest allies. For more, let's now go to David Amarian. He's the founder of Balco Capital, an emerging market investment manager based in Moscow. David, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So, so the latest report suggested blocking Nord Stream 2 could be part of a package of sanctions against Russia in the event of an attack to Ukraine. How credible, though, is the threat of suspending Nord Stream 2, given the very high degree of dependency that Europe has on gas? Well, uh, in, if there is an invasion of Ukraine, severe sanctions, including suspending uh, of uh, Nord Stream 2, is quite possible. And I think that this will be pushed by the US, UK, Poland and Ukraine. But there we will see a resistance from Germany and probably other European countries because this is critical for them. And replacing uh, this will be a very difficult task. But the volumes that will be coming from Nord Stream 2 are not new volumes. So Europe needs them for rebalancing their gas deficit. And it makes sense, especially during this year when consumption will be going higher. So, of course, geopolitics aside, it is definitely in Europe's interest to have Nord Stream 2 operational. Right. Interesting. A few weeks ago, uh, news of record high inflows of LNG from Asia uh, into Europe helped to cool down the, the spike in, in power and, and gas prices that we have witnessed. Uh, in case of a sharp and continuous reduction of gas imports from Russia, can these shipments uh, from Asia into Europe really provide a long-term solution to Europe's gas dependency, in your opinion? No, in my opinion, this is a temporary solution. The spike in LNG prices was mainly driven by gas prices, which make it economically interesting to redirect volumes to Europe. As the weather gets warmer and prices more or less stabilize, these volumes most likely will be redirected back to Asia. No, so, so to answer your question, you know, long term, I don't think this is sustainable. Uh, Right. And Europe, Europe gas dependency is clearly one of the biggest headaches for European policymakers right now. I mean, given the inflationary environments that we have in Europe, but also heavy subsidies to households and businesses facing huge increases um, in energy bills. I mean, first of all, how did we end up in this situation uh, in, in Europe in the first place? But also, what do you think European governments should do to tackle this issue? Well, how did we get here? It's a complicated question that has many different answers. But I think the, the simplest one, that this is a combination of factors. Uh, on the supply side, Europe blames Russia for decreasing exports and redirecting some of the volumes to Asia. Russia blames Europe, mainly German importers, of a reversal of flows and reselling Russian gas, which lifted the price even higher instead of uh, relieving price pressures. And on the demand side, obviously, expectation of cold winter, and we can see that's happening, coupled with European economies reopening after lockdowns, caused the demand to soar and the European gas storages to deplete. Um, to solve, this is, this is not a quick solution. There is no quick solution. But the, mm -hmm. first of all, uh, EU needs to be even more unified. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easier said than done, of course, but uh, with, 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 with time, EU will work out some kind of a joint initiative that will regulate and unify gas storage politics, combine gas acquisition from non-EU countries, and continue efforts of unifying electricity markets, building infrastructure for LNG, right. etc. But uh, it's just not, not as easy as it seems, and right. it's diff definitely not a quick solution. Interesting, David. And one last question very quickly. Where do you see uh, oil prices going in the medium term? Well, a quick answer. I think that we will see, we, we, we could see higher than 80, but uh, sometime uh, in the second half of, uh, of this year, we should see it stabilized from 80 to 90, around that. Uh, but the price today is, is justified, and there are fundamental and technical reasons for that. Many thanks, David Amarian. Many thanks for being with us today for the interesting analysis. Thank you.